my name is Victor Zapanta. Uh, I'm super excited to be chatting with you all today. I will also admit I'm also quite nervous, so I appreciate your patience. It's been a little bit since I've spoken to more than a handful of colleagues on Zoom. Uh, but yeah, um, I've had really like the honor of working on public health projects with Skylight for the past four and a half years. Uh, I worked in civic tech for over 12 years, which is mind blowing to say aloud. But yeah, I, I, I started out in civic tech uh, over at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau way back in 2010, where I was one of the first designers. And I, uh, after serving with the CFPB for four years, I joined 18F, where I also served there for four years, and I've been at Skylight since then. Um, and yeah, I'll give the opportunity to Liz to introduce herself. Hey, I'm Liz. Um, I am also a designer at Skylight. Um, <clears throat> at Skylight, I work on the de defense services side of things. So I work with the design studio, which is part of the uh, Bespin software factory, which is part of the Air Force which you may have known if you heard me say Bespin because the Air Force absolutely cannot stop naming things after Star Wars. They just will not quit. So <laughs> that's what I do. I teach uh, airmen how to design stuff on the job. It's super fun. Um, and I've gotten the chance to do a couple service design projects um, during my time with the Air Force that hopefully I'll get to share a little bit about. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna stop talking. Go ahead, Victor. Great. Um, yeah, we're gonna ask folks to share questions in the chat and we'll try our best to pause for questions throughout the presentation. So what is service design? Uh, before we jump into that question, I actually wanted to share a story that I think might be helpful. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my commute this morning. Throughout this, I'm gonna share some photos of my commute. And if you want more context, please feel free to download our presentation where we'll include descriptions of each photo. So I happen to live in New York City and every day I take the subway into the office. So each morning I leave my apartment in the Lower East Side and I walk towards the Delansky Essex train station that's just around the corner from me. From about a half block out, I can see the iconic green lampposts that mark the entrance. I see the Essex Street station sign, and I see the JZ FM sign telling me which trains stop here. So I walk down the stairs and towards the turnstile, where an entry sign clearly directs me towards the platform. I take out my phone and tap it on this touch indicator to pay the $2.75 fare. And I'm personally the type of person who wants to know how long of a wait I can expect. So I walk down the platform, which is flanked in J, J train signs to the nearest arrivals board. And here I can see that the next train is gonna take about a minute to arrive. This board also tells me that the train terminates at Broad Street, which is the direction of my office. So I know that I'm on the right side of the platform. Finally, a J train arrives and I hop on. A digital sign on the train tells me that my destination is about two stops away. And a few minutes later, an automated announcement comes on the speaker saying, th th saying this is Canal Street and we arrive at the station. I exit the train and I head towards the red exit sign. I head up the stairs, exit through the turnstiles and walk a couple blocks to the computer where I'm sitting at right now. Uh, so why am I walking you through this admittedly mundane story? Um, I think that the New York subway system is a great example of service design. Well-executed service design is one where the user has little to no insight into the number of machinations that take place behind the scenes to create the experience. The subway is an orchestra of, of interconnected systems and services, all of which come together to get 4 million New Yorkers from point A to point B every single day. There are so many invisible systems that go into making the New York City subway a good experience. There's the actual train conductor that safely operates the train doors and makes announcements. There are the people who design, build, and maintain wayfinding signs, which help us navigate stations. There's the track workers who maintain and repair the tracks. One of those systems I've talked about that I rely on heavily is the countdown clock. This was a game changer before it was rolled out across the system in 2018. And before that, there was really no accessible way to know how long you'd be waiting for the train. So when I'm looking at the arrival countdown clock, I know nothing about the Bluetooth beacons that have been installed in the first and last car of each train to broadcast their current location. I know nothing of the Bluetooth receivers installed in stations to communicate with the beacons on the track to track, uh, to track their location. And I know nothing of, their, of the workers like in this photo who had to install these receivers. I know nothing about the software that powers the calculator, so you know whether your train is two minutes or 20 minutes away. 
The orchestration of these things that operate behind the scenes to make your experience a good one is service design. I should also note that while there's a lot that the MTA gets right, there's no shortage of areas that they need improvement on, especially when it comes to making the subway system more accessible to people with disabilities. So with that, let's look at the question of what is service design again? It's important to note that, the, that service design is a subset of human-centered design. It doesn't replace HCD. It's a distinct approach to HCD that may work best for your problem. And I think it's particularly useful, a, a particularly useful approach for the types of problems we see in with service delivery in government specifically. So service design is a holistic approach to designing services. It enables organizations to create high quality experiences for both customers and for the providers of the services that they interact with. Service design often has a more intentional focus on the employee experience. Streamlining those employee facing or backstage processes improves the experience of those employees, which enables them to provide better experiences for their users. So now I'm gonna walk us through how USDS and Skylight use service design to help with the CDC's COVID-19 response efforts. So I'm gonna ask us all to think back to 2020 during the early days of the pandemic. Two residents in the life, in the, the life care center in suburban Seattle died of a respiratory disease on February 26th, weeks before any major US city was shut down. This was before testing was readily available and it would be days before their cases were confirmed. More residents were falling ill and the staff put the facility on lockdown. Workers put up a sign in the front of the facility. It read, we are having a respiratory outbreak. No visitors allowed. By the time COVID tests came back, 129 people, including two thirds of the facility's residents, tested positive for COVID. This was just the beginning of a pandemic where we'd eventually see over a third of the deaths linked to nursing homes by June of 2021. The congregate living situations, the flow in and out of these spaces by staffers and outsiders, and the fact that, these, that this disease was particularly lethal to adults in their 60s and older, led to long-term care facilities becoming ground zero for the COVID-19 pandemic. By federal mandate, every COVID-19 test that was conducted in the country had to be reported to public health agencies so they could take actions to stem the spread of the, of the disease. For places like hospitals and medical labs, they already had systems in place to report this data. But many places where testing was happening didn't have these sorts of systems let alone data pipelines to public health departments. So let's imagine for a second that you're one of the frontline workers, a nurse at one of these nursing homes. You're short staffed and you're working long hours because many of your coworkers have gotten sick from COVID. Every time a positive case is found, you have to test every worker and every resident in your facility. That means you're responsible for conducting dozens, if not hundreds of tests per week and for reporting all of those to public health. This is an example of a COVID case reporting form from April 2020. The mechanisms you have for reporting these are very manual. For every one of these tests, you have to enter detailed facility information. You have to enter patient demographic information, like name, address, date of birth. And you have to enter this information for every patient every time that they are tested. Reporting test results has, has basically become a full-time job on top of your job as a nurse. And you're already short staffed as it is. Reducing the massive burden of reporting COVID-19 test results would be of incredible value to these nursing homes. And this was the birth of Simple Report. Simple Report allowed these types of facilities to enter a roster of their patients and all of their staffers. Once that information was in the system, a health worker could look up a patient, enter any relevant information, like whether or not they're currently experiencing symptoms, and then select their test result. Simple Report, through its sister application report stream, handed off the data directly to public health departments. This resulted in a massive time savings for, for nursing homes. And we're proud to say it was a success. Simple Report launched in December 2020 after being piloted in Arizona. And as of this Monday, we have over 12,000 facilities reporting tests. And our platform has recorded 7.7 .7 million test events in total. 
After launching, our team looked to expand our research from our initial focus on nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Some reports strength was in reporting tests for facilities where a fixed roster of people would be tested repeatedly. So we quickly identified K to 12 schools as a space that could benefit from adopting some report. They were a natural fit. The, yeah, they were a natural fit for support report. So we so so in early 2021, uh, many schools were were still closed, but by the fall, many schools were beginning to reopen to in-person learning. When we first built support report, getting our app live so that our facilities could start reporting their data to public health was our biggest priority. That meant we had to make some compromises, one of which was how we handled onboarding to the app. Onboarding to Simple Report took two to four weeks. It was a complex multi-step process that actually involved interacting with HHS, HHS employees directly. It's clear that our existing process just wouldn't scale to the demand that we're expecting as schools opened up. So in order to understand that what we need, in order to understand what we needed to do to be able to support a massive influx of users, we began with creating a service blueprint to map out our current onboarding process. This blueprint shows our process for onboarding to simple report around March 2021. So on the left, you can see the actions that our users would take. These interactions are known as the front stage, which we'll describe in further detail later. On the back stage are the actions that HHS, USDS, and local public health departments would take through this process. These are the behind the scenes interactions or backstage actions. The first step to onboarding was that users would fill out a request form on simplereport.gov. USDS would then email an agreement to the organization. After that agreement was signed, HHS would email the user with a link to make a Zoom appointment. Once they were on that Zoom call, an HHS employee would verify the identity of the organization administrator. Our team would then create the organization in Simple Report. That triggered an account creation email from Okta, which is the system that we use for access management. The user would follow a link in the email in order to create a Simple Report account. From there, they can begin using Simple Report and they can begin reporting tests. So as you can see, this is a pretty involved process that required manual intervention by employees. And with the coming school year, we were expecting our signups to increase massively. There's a major risk that, that the HHS and USDS teams handling this process would be overwhelmed as schools began ramping up for the new school year. This blueprint helped us get our arms around every step of the process of onboarding. And it served as a guide to ensure that we knew where the greatest constraints in the current process were. And one of, those, one of those constraints was the process of identity verification. So as I mentioned, users would have to schedule a Zoom call with an HHS rep who would verify the organization administrator's identity in that call. So our developers looked into alternative mechanisms to confirm the identity of our users. We ended up partnering with Experian to integrate their identity verification system into Simple Report. This allowed users to verify their identity by answering a set of personal finance questions which eliminated the need for a scheduled Zoom call with a CDC employee. This brought down the time from sign up for sign up from around two to four weeks to a matter of minutes. And after these changes, facilities could start reporting on Simple Report the same day that they signed up. With the old onboarding process, we were typically bringing in around 30 new users a week. When we launched the new process, that number quickly jumped to around 200 new users a week. And within six months, we had increased the number of organizations using Simple Report by 800%. So in improving the employee-facing experience by eliminating most of the manual interventions, we were able to significantly improve the experience of our users and to scale user adoption. And with that, I'll pass along to Liz, who will be speaking in more detail about the toolkits and frameworks for service design. Thanks, Victor. All right, <clears throat> so like Victor said, I'm gonna be talking about toolkits, frameworks, how you can do these things. Um, I don't know about you, but when I hear stories like the one that Victor just told, I always feel very uh, inspired, but also intimidated. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I could take on something that's that complex and impactful. Um, 
And so that's why we wanted to provide some of these frameworks for you to break down like a, a big project like this with this kind of impact. How can you actually go about using some of the methodologies that Victor talked about? Um, so go ahead to the next slide. Can I do that? Someone else doing it? Thank you. Thank you, slide uh, fairy. So, okay. If you remember nothing else from this day, this is a good candidate to remember. Um, this is an illustration that's taken from our website, um, which Cheryl showed earlier. It's the service design uh, framework area. And this is kind of one of the um, one of the most popular visualizations and explanations of what service design is, not this specific diagram, but this kind of thing. You can think back to Victor's story about catching the train, right? So remember, Victor is kind of like our audience. He's the guy who is doing the thing. He is trying to use the service to get from point A to point B. Uh, front stage, you might think of, you know, the ticket turnstile or maybe an actual human being who is there in the station ready to answer Victor's questions. What we don't think about, which Victor pointed out really well, is what is in the backstage. So like maybe all of those um, sensors that we talked about that make the uh, countdown clock run. But then you even got behind the scenes, right? You've got people who are sitting in finance and legal inside of different organizations. Maybe you even got like um, some sort of field service worker scheduling tool that impacts whether the guys can get in to install the sensors and that changes the experience. So there's all these different parts of an organization or other organizations that come together to form one experience that Victor in the audience sees. Go ahead. Okay, so if you're wondering what would be a good candidate for a service design problem, I always think of looking for like a really, really big problem. Big problems can be big for a number of reasons, but the ones that we see often are a lack of information or knowledge about the customers that you serve. And this can happen for a lot of reasons. Maybe you just don't have mechanisms in your organization to be able to get in touch with people. Maybe you have legal problems barring you from doing so. But you can also have siloed communication, right? So one part of your organization knows a lot about your users and the other doesn't, and you don't know that the others exist. You might also have outdated and fragmented and insufficient technology systems, like we saw with that example with Simple Report, that just make those other two problems worse, right? Not only do you not know that other people exist who have the knowledge that you need, but you can't get a hold of them. Um, and the other thing that I look for personally when people bring projects to me is what I call glacier buzzwords. So these are things that look like pretty innocent on the top, but are like hiding a huge potential massive dysfunction underneath. Um, my favorite one is digital transformation, um, often accompanied by lift and shift. When somebody's talking about taking an existing process, lifting it up, and then just moving it over to a different platform or making it digital, usually if you peel back the covers, you're going to find like a whole mess of um, interconnected systems that need to be touched as well. This is um, another example of uh, the kind of thing that you might be thinking about for service design. This is just a screenshot of digital.gov, and it's intended to uh, remind us all that we've got increasing mandates about customer experience um, in federal government. Now, in on top of, you know, actually providing a service, you have to worry about all this other stuff that's on this left column here, right? Like you provide a service, you also have a website. Maybe you don't really think about that website all that much. Now you're um, on the hook to make sure that like there's a good customer experience on it. Um, it can be really hard to figure out how to meet those mandates without having some sort of more holistic approach like service design. Go ahead to the next slide. So this is the framework that we mentioned um, that is on the website. If you have seen uh, human-centered design diagrams before, this will be very similar. Um, one of the things that Victor and I talked about a lot as we were putting together this presentation is what is the actual difference between service design and product design and human-centered design and user experience? Um, in some ways, they're kind of all the same thing. They're, they're kind of all like this approach of, of trying to bring human beings into the process of designing a product or system. Um, but the way that I think about service design is that it's sort of a level of abstraction above product design, or like the scope is a little bit broader. So the phases in the project are going to feel really similar if you've done a product design experience project. Um, initiate, discover, strategize, experiment, and implement. And I'm going to run through those, um, each one of those in detail in a minute here. I wanted to pause and see, it looks like we don't have any questions in the chat, but as I go forward, um, Please feel free to put any questions in there um, and we will get to them as we, as we go. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so first phase is initiate. This is the phase that uh, Mari's workshop is gonna talk, um, touch on rather later today. 
So this is your kickoff meeting, right? Everybody is probably familiar with these. You're starting a new big project. You need to get all the people in the room and talk about what you're going to do. Um, for service design projects or product design projects that you want to turn into service design, this is a really critical phase. Um, these projects can be very big and the scope can be very ambiguous. So getting really clear about what specifically, what problem you want to focus on rather than outcome um, is going to set you up for success in this phase. And like I mentioned, Mari is going to do an exercise with us on stakeholder mapping that's going to help us get our head around that idea of abstraction or scope with service design. If you're thinking about your stakeholders, if you're just thinking about I'm building a product to sell to a customer versus you're thinking about your stakeholders as I'm creating an experience that involves a lot of people I don't have any, any uh, contact with for a customer. Your idea of who your stakeholders are changes a lot. Go ahead. This I thought was a really good example from Victor's story of uh, the sort of like initiate phase and picking a problem to focus on. When COVID uh, first started getting really hot, it was terrifying, right? Like we all remember that. Everything felt like a huge five alarm fire. Um, it was just, it was really difficult to even figure out what problem to focus on if you wanted to help out because everything did seem so overwhelming and interconnected. Um, what I thought was interesting about the Simple Report team's uh, focus was trying to pick an area that was not very well uh, supported with current systems. So that would be your non-traditional testing sites like your nursing homes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Discover is a phase that, again, you'll be very familiar with if you've done any kind of like product design. Um, this is the phase that feels like it never ends and it kind of doesn't. You're just always discovering things that you wish you knew at the beginning of a project. Um, there's lots of different methodologies you can use for your discovery process, but your goal is to try to have a deep understanding of the systems and people as they exist um, that you're going to try to intervene in, right? Go ahead. So um, probably the most famous artifact to come out of a service design a project is a service design blueprint, service blueprint. Uh, Victor talked about this a little bit earlier, but what really sets service design apart from other kinds of design, like we talked about, is that concept of front stage, backstage, um, and what's visible and what isn't visible to the person having the experience. What I really like doing when I'm doing this work is using a service blueprint as a way of synthesizing my research. So when I do an interview with somebody or I hold a workshop, I then go back to my service blueprint draft and I update it with what I learned, um, what contradicts something that I learned already, where nobody seems to know what's going on. Um, and by doing that, it helps me shape my research, um, make sure that I'm staying on track, but also helps make sure um, that I have something to go over with my stakeholders. So I'm sharing that learning with them as I'm going. Okay. Next thing you need to do is once you have a pretty good understanding of what problem you're trying to solve and the space of the problem is figure out where you want to start with solutions. Um, in this case, in Simple Reports case, Reality gave Victor and the team a real hand. Um, next slide. Uh, by having a new huge problem with non-traditional testing sites looming in the future. Um, at the point when we were looking at uh, reopening schools, we knew that we were going to have to have a whole new group of these users of these non-traditional testing sites onboarding into Simple Report and being able to use it. Um, so that really helped them focus more specifically on, we're going to look at the art onboarding process um, and improve that. Go ahead. Okay, experiment. This is going to feel really familiar if you've done any sort of like agile software development. The idea is you try to test out a couple of those ideas and you try to test them out in the cheapest, quickest way possible to try to figure out what is and isn't worth spending more of your time on. Um, one of the things that I really love about service design is that you don't have to prototype technology. You don't have to, you don't have, to have anything to do with technology, right? Uh, Skylight does digital transformation, but that doesn't mean that we can't recognize a problem that is not a technology problem and figure out a different and better non-technology solution for it. Um, being able to solve multiple problems and having that bigger toolbox available to me instead of just let's design a UI about it is really gratifying and really fun. Um, but it can be difficult to figure out what you're actually going to test. Go ahead. So in this case, again, the service blueprint comes in really handy because it's a nice visualization of how you realize where your big problem is. You've got a couple different phases of onboarding that are listed out in the darker blue at the top. It says interest, getting access, and setup. Each one of those headings is a chunk, right? A chunk of activities in a related phase. 
you can see that getting access is huge. It's twice the size as the other columns for an action that is not actually that important, right? It's not, this is not a key user goal with simple report. Um, so that was a pretty clear sign that that was the area that they needed to focus on specifically. Go ahead. And then the last thing to do is implement. <laughs> you know, after you've done all that, it's going to feel all downhill, right? Um, so you need to plan for any changes your solutions require, uh, work with other departments or other people who own processes that you might need to intervene in, um, and most importantly, well not most importantly, but importantly is set up metrics in advance to measure the improved service um, that you have put together. Go ahead. So this is, again, our uh, really nice graph of a line going up and to the right, which is how you want to end every presentation. This is uh, the onboarding numbers for Simple Report. Being able to track onboarding numbers is obviously you know, a really good metric for improving your onboarding um, flow. And the more of these kinds of projects you do, the more metrics you end up tracking, the more you sort of slowly build up this um, like analytics portfolio of your, of your service. So you slowly over time have a better picture of um, what's working, what isn't, and what you need to go back and do another service design project on. Okay, so in summary, these are the phases. Initiate, discover, strategize, experiment, and implement. You do not need to take screenshots of this slide. This is, like I said, all on the website. Um, the next slide, I believe, is a screenshot. There it is. If you go to work and then you go to, I believe it's toolkits, you'll be able to find this. All right. The next things we're going to do um, is, like we said, we're going to work on a workshop later, but we're also going to have a case study presentation and a panel discussion. Like Cheryl mentioned, these are going to be things that have a sort of varying relationship with technology. So I'm really excited to hear everybody speak. Um, and let me check the chat again for questions. Thank you so much, Liz. We have a couple I can feed you. You don't have to read back through the whole chat. Uh, Federica would like to know, um, and Victor partially answered this, but I thought you might also have uh, one to weigh in. What are some actions or tools that you used to build the service blueprint that you showed earlier? For example, interviews, surveys, other things. How did you come up with the information that you showed us? Victor, do you want to add anything to the simple report one, that specific one? Um, I ran a little bit about how we built that out. Yeah, we so we used a tool called Mural to build it out. Like I mentioned in the chat, uh, there's there's some great uh, templates for uh, building out a service blueprint. Um, but yeah, I mean that was really a, a team collective effort based upon our 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 shared understanding of of the the service and all the moving parts. Mm -hmm. So I think that that was really a conversation between both design research product management and our engineers who, yeah. who really knew the, the the back end of what was happening in our in our service. Yeah, I think I almost what? think of them. Oh, sorry. Am I talking over someone or is that just my mic? Go ahead, Liz. Okay. Um, I almost think of blue service blueprints as like um like a visualization of a conversation, right? Like they that's really where they come from is having these repeated conversations over and over again with your stakeholders, with your team, trying to figure out like, okay. This person said this is the process, but this policy document says it's this, and this person at this other installation says it's this. So, like, how do you figure out how to how to square that? Square that, even though I'm making a triangle. Um, but in terms of research methodology, yeah, for me, mostly interviews um, and then reading, doing like a lot of desk research um, because I work with the Air Force, so like everything has some sort of policy doc that um, somebody could cite if they wanted to. In reality, who knows if anybody follows the policies, but there's tons. Okay, we have another question from Rachel, who is, uh, and I think this is a, such a lovely question. I'm curious if and how and when the team took intentional pauses when the work was overwhelming. I think we really felt the emotional impact of your story, Victor. Um, if you did, how was this initiated? Who facilitated? Did the team have a design care plan in place before the launch of the work? That's a great question. Um, I will admit, like, we all kind of were feeling like incredible pressure during this time. Um, I don't know that I, we honestly took much by way of pauses. 
um, you know, certainly, I think the, 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 the closest thing that we came to any pauses was working on features that didn't have as hard of a deadline and weren't as on fire, right? Like we knew we had to launch that thing that I shared by like August of 2021, or like basically our whole thing would catch fire, right? Like we didn't have enough HHS staffers. We didn't have enough USDF folks to handle those manual interventions. And um, I think, again, like the closest thing that we had, to be honest, to a pause would have been the times after some of those launches when we chose to focus on things that were, that, that didn't have, it, it, things that improve the quality of lives of our users, um, but didn't have as hard of a deadline. Thank you so much, Victor. All right, I have another question here from Kriti. Uh, when you're in the discover stage and putting together the service blueprint, I often encounter that there is the journey as it is supposed to happen, or sometimes the journey managers think is happening. And then there's all the little workarounds that people have come up with along the way and how it actually happens. Do you have any tips on how to capture those workarounds and how to frame those potentially as opportunities for further research or investigation? And then Cheryl would add, I've also seen where uh, sometimes those little workarounds are things that people will get in trouble for. And so how do you document when that's happening, uh, when a manager might be coming in and saying, you aren't supposed to be doing it this way. So can you talk about how you strategize a blueprint in the real world? I can, uh, I can take a stab at this. Um, I'm laughing because that's like, honestly, my favorite part of the job is finding out um, all the weird little things that people do to just try to like make do. Um, so for me, like I'm just, I'm always really excited to discover those things. Having worked uh, for most of my career in enterprise software, what I do find though, is sometimes you end up in this really weird, um, awkward position where you're having to advocate to managers for their employees because the managers do not understand the job or working conditions of the employees. Um, it's super awkward. I feel very privileged to be in a situation to be able to do that. Um, but it is really difficult. One of the things that I try to do just in terms of like uh, keeping a document readable um, is I'll do like essentially a cutaway. So like I'll have my giant service blueprint. And when I realize like for one example, um, we had this accommodation project with the Air Force where nobody understood how funding worked. And so we ended up having almost like a sub service blueprint like in a box separately um, just addressing that part um, the other thing I tried to do and it's really hard when you're working um, with a small team but even when I'm working with a small team I try to keep uh, participants um, what's the word identities is the word their identities as anonymous as possible and just refuse to give any more detail uh, than somebody's like comment um, because I have had it happen, like you mentioned, Cheryl, where like you find a really interesting workaround to what happens is somebody's manager then goes and yells at them. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my long answer. Victor, do you have a better answer? I bet you do. No, I think that's spot on. I, 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 that that follow-up is an interesting one. And I'm curious about your thoughts on that, Liz, around how you protect the identity of employees um, who may be using workarounds that aren't officially allowed you know, I, I can speak a lightly to that, and that's that um, we, 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 we try to ensure that only the people who need access to information and to, re to the actual raw research notes, um, like so the core product team should typically be the only ones who are able to gain access to the actual raw notes. We also got our way to anonymize those notes, so the, those notes should not contain actual names. Um, but then, uh, of course, like given enough context, um, one can figure out who a, an individual is, in which case, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of curious if you have any thoughts on that list. It's kind of context by context, honestly. I have had that happen, and it goes back to that weird, awkward position that you're in, right? Um, one of the things that I think we can be very useful in for teams is not just coming in and helping them do a service design project, but like helping the team to understand how it functions better. 
Um, and sometimes people will listen to us as consultants or as designers who are external to a team coming in more than they will to the team themselves. So sometimes you can pick up um, and amplify and give uh, credence, I guess, to some of the problems that the employees are having that you're you're working with. Um, so you can act as an advocate for them, but it's, yeah, it's really hard. I've, I've had people pressure me to give away identities of people and just had to be like, no, dude, I'm not going to do that. Um, yeah, I wish I had a better answer because like I always am a little bit worried about what happens when we leave, you know. Excellent. We do have another question from the chat. Fanny would like to know, um, first of all, says the case studies are super interesting, which I agree with. Um, and who coordinates everything that is happening between the front stage and the backstage? The answer is no one. <laughs> one of the things that I've learned is that just everything everywhere is chaos all the time. <laughs> so I have not found uh, that usually anyone else um, like has a clear idea of how the service works when I'm in discovery trying to figure it out. Like that ends up being a huge uh, value add that you bring is just helping an organization understand how it functions sometimes for the first time ever. Um, but I'm not usually finding anybody behind the scenes who already is, is coordinating front stage and backstage. Um, because my projects are generally like I'm brought in to design a piece of technology and I'm trying to cram service design in the edges to make sure that that piece of technology can actually be successful in what it's supposed to do. Um, I don't end up touching like policy and that kind of thing a lot. Um, so I'm kind of curious, Victor, I think that you've had a, a broader experience and you might have a better way of answering that question. Not particularly. I mean, I, I will admit like in, in the example that I shared, you know, it, it, it the the process the service blueprint that I shared was something that naturally evolved, um, and this was us again, kind of like backwards engineering, like oh this is a service, and us recognizing it, it as a service after it had been built, after these interconnected systems had been built out. Um, so yeah, I I I think what we eventually got to was to a space where our developers effectively automated the level of coordination that needed to happen. Um, and yeah, and that was obviously done with, through a collaboration between between the, 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 the whole product team. Amazing, you all. Uh, and so uh, we do have a little more time in this session. There's more time for questions. I think if anybody would like to use the raise hand feature in Zoom um, to ask a question verbally, you're welcome to do that or continue to drop them in the chat. Uh, I wanted to call out that we uh, have a Taylor on with us who's going to be speaking on a panel later um, in the fall in the session right after this and she said that her experience includes some need to protect the identities of people in service blueprints and she's going to be very happy to share that experience with you all so uh, look forward to that Hillary you've got your hand up you're welcome to come off mute and ask your question Hi, hey folks, thanks for hosting this today. I'm excited to be here. Um, I actually wanted to ask a follow-up question to what Rachel posed earlier about taking pauses in this super heavy work, that not only was it something that you know you were working to support, but you were also experiencing in the midst of everything. And so I'm really curious, while you said, you know, we didn't have that room for pause, we know that we were all moving through crisis and trauma. I'm curious, looking back on it, what do you wish that you had had available to you? Or what do you wish you could have done differently given the appropriate support and resources? Oh, wow, well, yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, I mean, I'll admit, like, there was a decent amount of burnout happening on the team. Um, you know, we had a lot of people, folks in and out and having those conversations exactly about what you're talking about, about the fact that we we're working on something that we were experiencing in our lives. Um, you know, I think we had a very emotionally safe team, but I don't think that we were as outward about the extent to which uh, those stressors were really affecting us individually. Um, and yeah, I mean, like we had amazing folks on the project, especially at the at the onset, 
um, you know, who would eventually peter out and, you know, so, some sometimes it may have been due to the stresses, sometimes it may have been just up there ready for the next challenge. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think again, like to me, the the biggest way to help address that would have just been uh, being more actively open about our experiences, uh, both working in and, and experiencing uh, the pandemic. Is there anything question? that you would add, Liz? And also, thank you, Victor. I, I, pretty much my experience has been very similar to Victor's. When I've been working on emotionally intense projects um, during a global catastrophe, it's been really hard for me to uh, separate from them enough to realize when I need to separate from them, if that makes sense. Um, I wish I had a better answer other than I think that we all collectively as an industry need to do um, a lot better with that. One of the things that I do think would be useful, especially next time I'm doing um, really intense work, is to honestly pad my delivery deadlines a bit more. Um, I think that designers especially have a tendency to, if you're passionate about the work, be like, yeah, I can do that tomorrow. I can get that done. Like, no problem. That shouldn't be hard. Um, and then also, you know, volunteer to speak at a service design conference that your company is putting together and like, you know, a whole bunch of other stuff. You're always doing a lot of stuff. Um, and so trying to give myself more space to be able to think and not feel like I am frantically behind on a deadline all the time at the same time that the world is on fire, I think would be a good idea. I appreciate your responses. Thanks, y'all. Just to add one last thing, I think the the, the unifying word that keep, that keeps coming to mind for me is grace and giving ourselves grace and giving our teammates grace. I love that, Victor. Thank you, Emily. I see that you have your hand up. You're welcome to come off mute and ask your question. Thank you. Hi. Thank you guys for doing this. It's really it's really cool to see all these other nerds who like love this stuff. Um, I'm wondering, like, when it's not. COVID, right? Like when it's not this huge disaster, what normally triggers like a company or an agency to reach out to service designers? Like what is usually the trigger for them that like we have a problem and we need you? So some of the projects that I've got coming up came from doing much more like a tactical kind of work and then establishing a relationship with a stakeholder that then wants to bring me on to do like a bigger uh, service design, like properly service design project. So we've got one with the Air Force that's pending. Um, and we started that by just doing like a, like a basic app critique with them. Um, so like the more that you can get in with the team and the more that you can demonstrate value doing something that, you know, probably isn't that interesting to you, but it's really helpful to them. Uh, we'll start to build that trust and relationship. Um, the other thing is I noticed somebody in the chat, Neural, I think I said your name wrong, I apologize. Um, but this is really common, the idea that like, you've got a big project, it should be thought of as a service design project with a tech component, but what your organization has the money for is the tech. Like they were able to get the budget and the funding for buying like a new uh, ticketing system or whatever. Um, so that's where I find it useful to try to shove service design in where nobody asked for it and try to pretend that it's just like a normal design process. And what are you talking about? Like, this is how everything is done. Um, and just see how far I can get before someone calls me on it. Victor, do you have a better answer? No, I mean, that just profoundly resonates with me that exactly that, that like, it's very rare for folks to understand that they have a service design problem. Uh, so, you know, you approach it, like I said, Service design is a subset of human-centered design, right? As in my perception, it's that focus on the employee-facing experience that that distinguishes it from more more traditional design approaches. And uh, yeah, I mean, more often than not, folks think that their, their, their orgs are working in a perfectly efficient manner. And like, it's I I've I've found it rare that folks that that clients will be like we have a service design problem. Instead, at best, the, you know, as you kind of hinted at, typically they'll be like we have a tech problem, and then we're like oh that's actually a design problem. Oh that's a service design problem.
thank you. Fantastic. Uh, I think we potentially have time for one more question if anybody has. Uh, if not, I would love to invite Victor and Liz. Do you have any parting thoughts for us or any suggestions for where folks might get? Oh, wait, before we do that, Suzanne has a question. Thank you, Suzanne. Hello, thank you. Um, I am love where you're going with this talk about um, tech problems and service design problems. And I'm wondering um, how do you... Um, convince your team internally to work in this way like when you know we talked about it being a visualization of a conversation which i really love um but i feel like i have a hard time sometimes convincing my team to take the time to make a blueprint and to use have this like collective way of understanding it when we could just talk through the problem and like figure it out so do you have any hints on how to um get people to adopt that within your company? It's a really good question. Um, I don't know that my answer is going to be something you should emulate, but I'll be honest with you. I just start doing it. <laughs> I don't really ask anybody for permission. Um, and I've gotten a reputation as like, Liz loves a gnarly flowchart. Like that is the lady with the flowcharts. Um, and she will make you look at and talk about a flowchart for like an hour. Um, some of the stuff that I work on ends up being like like tech infrastructure for the Air Force, like real, real back end nerd stuff. Um, and I find that the engineers do like talking about a flowchart and will like want to kind of dissect it to death with you. Um, so sometimes if you can find a visualization, it doesn't have to be a standard service blueprint, but if you can find some way of um, sort of visualizing what you're talking about and documenting it um, that speaks to the stakeholders and team that you have that they naturally like and enjoy talking about flowcharts or get charts or whatever. Um, trying to meet them where they're at, I think is a good idea. Um, also just not asking for permission and doing what you're gonna do and telling them that this is what's happening now. I love that, thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. We got another question in the chat. Ilza would like to know, uh, do you have any quick advice for an entry-level service designer on joining government organizations? I will provide the most literal advice, and that's that, like, brush up on the government resume. Um, like, the government resume is a very different thing than a traditional resume. It doesn't need to be one page use all the keywords from a job description that you find. Make sure you're dropping in all the keywords that you possibly can. The CFPB actually has a great guide to creating a good government resume. And that's because I think for the first like couple rounds, they basically do keyword matching. So you want to make sure you get at minimum, you get past that. Again, that's 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 the most literal advice, but I think that's 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 one where where I would, I would start personally. Yeah, I mean, I know it sounds, I don't know, it sounds like it might not be the useful piece of information, but it like that genuinely is the best. Um, government hiring is so picky and weird and different from industry. Um, I ended up working at Skylight because I applied to a bunch of uh, government jobs back when I lived in California, like a while ago, um, and kept getting rejected for just the most bizarre reasons. So I really, really recommend um, networking at events like this, at like Code for America, at any kind of like chance you have to meet somebody on the inside of the agency you want to work at, because they're going to be um, a massive asset to you and helping you understand like where the secret tricks are that'll get your applications run out. 